G'day legends, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast where we interview people doing rad things in the mountain bike industry. Uh, this one is an absolute belter, um, super stoked on how this one turned out, super informative and yeah, we go into a bunch of stuff but before we jump on in, let me thank some sponsors. First up, we've got Trek Bikes, um, absolutely frothing my Fuel EX. Don't forget, you don't even need to deal with the shop as much anymore. Um, they still are available in shops. And if you've got a good local mechanic or someone that can get you a bike, go through them. But if you're one of those unfortunate people that only has one of those big red stores around, um, you can jump over to trekbikes.com.au and order straight off there. That's what I did with my last bike. Super fast, super efficient, and super easy. Frank Mountain Bike Apparel just dropped their 2024 collection and it looks wild. Um, I'm still frothing all my stuff. Um, the only problem with uh, being sponsored by them is their product lasts so long that I never, I rarely need new stuff. Um, their pants are still kicking on real well. Love their shorts. Uh, fist handwear, keeping my gloves, uh, keeping my hands protected every time, mess it up. Um, loving their stuff, especially in the kind of warm weather we've had. The Breezer Glove is a belter. Um, yeah, crazy designs, stand out from the crowd. You look rad, you ride fast. You know how it goes. Lead Out Sports is still offering the best tools on the market. Abbey tools are absolutely amazing and, man, they just work so damn well. So head over to leadoutsports.com.au and check out their stuff. Capped out caps. Uh, keeping my head stem on and looking good with their custom laser etched caps. And man, Oakley, Australia, keep my eyes protected uh, on the bike and at work. Don't forget to use Beyond the Tape over on the web stores just so you can get a bit of a discount as well. Um, up, up to 20% off on some of these guys' stuff, so make sure you use it. Anyway, you might have noticed I missed Shred there, but that's because our guest is Mr. Shred. Mixing Claire from Shreds jumped on. Uh, we talk about the product. We talk about his development, the marketing, and we go into his career, which is freaking amazing to say the least. So, uh, yeah, super stoked to have him on board. I think everyone's going to get something out of this one. Uh, short chat, but there's a lot of information. As per usual, grab beer, grab water, grab a wine, grab whatever makes you happy and enjoy this podcast. There's a fucking Lara Bingle. It all it all turns to shit pretty quick. <laughs> That's wild. All right, let's jump in then, just in case. Cool. Uh, yeah, Mick uh, from Shred. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me, Dad. It's um, good to be here. I mean, we've been trying to do this for a while. I know I connected with you a little while ago, and um, yeah, it hasn't quite aligned, but here we are. I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you do and, and your passion for the. The, the mountain bike industry and and um yeah i'm stoked to be here thanks man um as i say to some people getting guests on is like herding cats with bubbles like it's sometimes just so hard but it, sounds, everyone's sounds busy like, sounds like my two kids <laughs> um what do you do for those those guys at home that might not know who you are and yeah, obviously know. um you know you introduced me as mick from shred and that's definitely one part of it um my own um, shred bike care it's a australian owned and made bike care brand and i guess that's what we're here to talk about for the most part uh today um but it is still a it's still, still a side gig for me and uh, I, you know it's it's, it's kind of like my little baby um day to day i am the general manager of marketing um at a company called ame group and we are the commercial rights holder to the australian supercross championship uh, we also um, have a little bit to do or quite a bit to do with the World Supercross Championship um, and we do a lot of other things, you know, other clients of ours are Jet and Hunter Lawrence, um, they're, you know, uh, Australian Supercross riders who live in the US now who are kind of dominating over there, especially Jet. We have a bit to do with those guys. Um, we have other clients too within the supercars world and, you um, uh, fast moving consumer goods. Like we've just got clients all over the place in terms of marketing and, and social and content. But um, as it stands right now, as day to day, um, I'm, you know, I'd say 95% of my time is on Australian Supercross and World Supercross. 
Yeah, I saw you took Jet for a drive in your Porsche while you're over in the US. Yeah, well, it's kind of kind of the other way around. Was, uh, <laughs> we did we did a photo shoot with Jet and Hunter in Huntington Beach a few weeks ago, and um, it's a funny story. Just by chance, like we Adam Bailey and I, who's you know Adam Bailey runs the World Supercross Championship. Um, Bailey's been one of my best mates since we were. I don't know, 12, 13 years old um, and just by chance now that we're working together um, across World Supercross and, and his wife um, is the managing director of AME, so we're all really connected. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we were over there. We did a photo shoot for their new merch brands and Bailey and I actually wanted to go and watch the press conference at Anaheim too, um, but we didn't have passes to get in. So we were just gonna figure, you know, figure it out. And as we we're wrapping up the photo shoot, um, Jet and Hunter's dad, Dazzy, who I'm really good mates with, um, and I've been, you know, I've been friends with that family for a long time, like since they, those kids were ten and twelve, um, from my time when I was at Fox, which I, I'm sure we'll touch on a, you know, a little bit later. But long story short, we didn't have passes to get in, so Dazzy suggested one of us jump in the Ferrari with Jet, and one of us jump in the Porsche with Hunter, and they don't get stopped at the gate, so. Bailey and I looked at each other and just went, fuck, righto, let's go. If someone's um, got to do it, we'll, we'll do it, you know. Like. <laughs> right. So, you know, you jump in with Jet in the Ferrari, I'll jump in the Porsche with Hunter. And just like it was one of those moments where I just kind of sat back and said, what what the fuck? Like, how are we doing this shit? Like, <laughs> it's just everything we did on that trip, we just landed on our feet. I mean, but that's kind of like, you know, we're also good at what we do and you create those opportunities. But that was definitely – one of those moments and I've been working in the action sports space now. What am I, 42? So since I was 22, so 20 years, um, it's just one of those moments where I'm like, holy fuck, this is like, this is why we do it. It was, it was a really cool moment. How are you managing to do all of that and then still have a side hustle and kids? <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, right? Because like my work-life balance right now is the best it's ever been. I'm really fortunate that with my day job at AME, we've got a really good team. We're only small. Like there's four of us in the office now, five of us. At AME. And, I, and, you know, you've seen the way we operate when we had you involved in Adelaide Supercross mm. last year shooting for us. We just hustle. And, um, I think again, I think we're really, really good at what we do. Um, by no means am I the smartest person in that room the girls are way smarter than me but i come with that industry knowledge and passion and we're a really good team uh it's really dynamic and we just get shit done and and you know i'm fortunate enough that i um i'm in the office today but i i work from home most days and my work-life balance has never been better i've got two young kids um hudson's 13 and harla's nine hudson lives and breathes downhill um for offset like you know he Two weeks ago, we were at Threadbow. Last year, we were at the, uh, last week, we we're at the uh, Ball Ball for the Vic Downhill Series. So we're always somewhere with that. Um, my nine-year-old girl, she wants to be the next Caroline Buchanan, and and she um, races BMX, and um, she's decent at it too. You know, we went to Scotland together last year mm. for World Champs, and and we're trying to line up. You know, getting to Rock Hill for World Champs this year, and I've promised her we'll go to Denmark next year for World Champs. So, you know, as a nine-year-old, and she's telling me she wants to go to the Olympics. You know, fuck, most nine-year-olds are worrying about if their Pokemon thing staying alive. Like, <laughs> you know, she's telling me that, and whether it happens or not, it's probably more of a chance it won't. But why she's saying that at nine, I'm like, fuck, honey, let's go. I'll give her every opportunity I can. So, I mean, I'm just real fortunate that. Um, yeah, work is good. We are super busy. We, you know, start early, finish late, but we can take time off when we need. They, I don't know the, the the company, you know, Cali and Bailey. They're just great people to work for, and we're very fortunate we can do what we can do. And and then shred. We're kind of you know it's kind of trickling along at the moment. Um, when we created that or started that business three years ago, I had two partners, and we just come in with a bang and. Um, I guess we really rode that COVID wave when mm. the industry was going berserk and we kind of got like a false sense of confidence from that because it was, fuck, you won for us was massive and I'm like, holy shit, this is it. Mm. Obviously, there's been a bit of a, a, you know, the downturn and I actually want to listen to that podcast you put up um, yesterday. I, I meant to do that on the way in today, but I haven't yet because I think I saw on LinkedIn or, or was it LinkedIn you put up a post about a podcast about the the downturn of the industry. Yeah, the escape but, collective you know, crew, they've 
Yeah, Wade, Wade Wallace, who's a lord. He's, really? Okay, yeah. so I'd never heard of him before and he put that post up, so I'm going to listen to that on the way home. Mm. Um, but, yeah, look, Shred's fine. It's going along quite well um, how we do it. I'm lucky I've got a good distributor, um, GPI Polo. You know, they do Apollo bikes. They do DT Swiss, G Form. Um, you know, we work super closely with those guys and they do most of the work now. I mean, we look after the marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I would like to have more time to go and activate with Shred at bigger events and bits and pieces, you know, like I think what Matt from Crush does, um, he does an amazing job. What the guys at Markoff do, you know, they're everywhere and I'm a little bit envious of that, but I also know that's what they do for a living so they can do that. Um, you know, when I go to these races, I want to go as a dad first mm. and yeah. not necessarily stand in a tent promoting bike care products because, you know, at the end of the day too, no matter how many times you activate, you're not selling. You know, people don't go to events to buy stock. You know, bike right. quality. In my opinion, the most important thing from a bike care brand is relationships with the retailer because not too many people are going into bike stores to buy bike wash. They're going in to get a service or buy a helmet or new gear or a new tire and it'll be um, an impulse buy when they see something shiny on the counter. So it's probably, you know, from my side, and that's just the way I think in terms of strategy is that yeah, we can go to all events and bust our ass and do that, and that's great, but it's really up to the retailer to try and push it for you, and those retailer relationships are what's really important, um, which I was really lucky that when I started Shred, I had a lot of contacts through my time mm. when I worked at Monza Imports and Fox, and that was a really good way and an, kind of an easy way for us to get Shred through you know into these accounts um now having gpi on board we've kind of stepped back from that a little bit and we're relying on their relationships um mm -hmm. with dealers and obviously you know having dt swiss uh you know every bike store has dt swiss or they, they need it at some point so that was a huge hook for us as a brand to partner with those guys um but yeah i mean that's how we do it all i guess um Fuck, so many people ask, how do you do what you do? You're like the busiest guy. And I don't feel like I am. Maybe I am. <laughs> but also, when I'm not doing something, if we have like this weekend, we've got a weekend off. I'm like, fuck, what are we going to do? Mm. We're racing, you know, we're racing tonight. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow and Sunday. And I don't know if I like that. I'm not sure if it's an ADHD thing where I need to know what I'm doing next. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like, it's just weird. I'd love to know what I'm doing and love to be going riding with the kids somewhere because that's my favorite thing in the world to do is to watch them ride and ride with them and and see them happy and and what makes my kids happy is riding whether it's BMX or downhill so 100 that's sick let's uh wind it back a little bit you mentioned that the uh shred was a COVID kind of project mm -hmm. yeah um why did you get into the bike cleaning and bike care Products, because as you said, like Muckoff is a huge company. Yeah, yeah. And like, um, it's, a, it's a cool story. I mean, um, at the time during COVID, um, my son was riding on a GT BMX team, and okay. his his teammate at the time, um, Fergus, his dad and I, you know, we weren't. I wouldn't say we were friends or anything, but we definitely knew each other, and. Um, it was Hudson's teammate at the time and I was helping him out with some gear and stuff. Um, but his dad, um, Victor, um, was working in the hospitality, no, was working in a chemical, he was a chemical salesman and he was in the hospitality area. They supplied cleaning products to the hospitality area, uh, restaurants, bars, kitchens, um, whatever. And then when COVID kicked in obviously restaurants and everything closed mm. so he yeah. had a lot of time on his hands and so did their chemists in their labs <laughs> he, he he started playing around with some he, he he come to my house one day to pick up some gear that i got for um uh fergus and he said hey try this and he had a little bottle degreaser and a little bottle of bike wash concentrate and he goes i think there's something in this it's really good and i mean I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. You know, maybe he's like, maybe we could do something. I'm like, man, fuck. Like, <laughs> it's bike wash, it's degrees or whatever. I didn't have a passion for it. I actually didn't really care. Um, but obviously, I like looking after our shit. You know, we've got fucking 10 bikes in the garage across enduros, downhill bikes, 
motorbikes, oh, yeah. BMX, race bikes. So I like to look after our stuff. And I, I used it because I just needed to wash one of the bikes. And I was like, holy shit, this actually works really good. Um, it was the degreaser and also the wash. Um, so from there, I was like, okay, this kind of has legs. Um, I was working from home as well during COVID and I was working for Harley at that time. And during COVID, things went quiet there too. So I had a bit of time up my sleeve. I'm like, oh, let's have a crack. So yeah. that's how, that's where... Um, that's how shred started and and i guess victor was the guy behind the the liquid and and i was behind um the branding we also brought another guy on tim curtis who's our graphic designer at the time and and he um you know we didn't want to we didn't know where it was going to go so i didn't want to invest too much cash at the time Uh, at that time i thought this could be a thing where we'll just make some a couple of products two or three and we'll sell it out the back of our cars at bike at at bmx events (laughs) yeah to help help buy some chains of sprockets here and there. Um, and I didn't want to pay, you know, 10 grand to build, you know, a brand deck and 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 um, logos and bits and pieces like that. So we brought Tim on and I said, hey, Tim, we'll bring you in as an equal partner if you just design everything for us. Sick. Yeah. And he did and he made it look fucking epic. Um and then we started doing that. I started having conversations with retailers and distributors, you know, just through my network and people started taking it. You know, we started with three products, a ready to use wash, a concentrate wash and a degreaser. Um, and then from there, each month, we just started dropping a new product. Victor would work on that. We had, you know, eco clean and then a tubular sealant. And then we started working on chain lubes and then, mm. uh, you know, stuff. Uh, silicon polishes like you know all this stuff's quite easy to make it's not difficult um and then you just tweak it to how you want it to work yeah you know yeah. we come um you know we were we got a silicon spray and we're like yeah it's good but i think we could add more silicon to it so we changed it from 10 percent to 12 percent, and then went to 14 percent because that's just what we wanted to do so there's little things like that and then you change you know you can come up with your color and then you, you know you get big enough where you got to buy this stuff in thousand liters and that's when you can start um, you know, uh, producing your own and working with chemists on, on formulas and bits and pieces, and that's where we're at now. So, I mean, as it stands right now, I think we've got 11 products. Um, all of our products are, you know, we've got our own formulas now, um, okay. except for one, which is an off-shelf product, and and they're the same as, you know, that product in particular. Every one of those yeah. products is exactly the same. Um, and you could be paying... Four dollars is super cheap for a product, or you could be paying forty bucks <laughs> for that same can, and we're kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm not going to say which one it is because everyone will go out and get it from super cheap for four bucks. Um, <laughs> but it's essentially the same. It's essentially the same. Um, so yeah, that's how it all kicked off, and it just grew from there. Again, um, our product range grew, our presence in the market grew. I went out and. Um, I spent 10 years again at, at Monza Imports um, and, and worked on the Fox brand um, in mainly Moto um, and BMX and Wake and a few other things. I wasn't really on the bike side of it though. Um, but I reached out to the Fox distributor in Chile um, and we sent him a container of shred. Um, I spoke to the Fox distributor in Japan. They took a bunch. Yeah, um, right. They took a bunch. So I was really using my network from you know busting my ass um mm. in a previous life and using those connections to really support us and that's how we got ourselves into doors um you know f- um sam moore um introduced yeah. me to the guys at pushies he, they got us on pushies um you know we worked our way with mtb direct and then um you know the guys at yarrow valley cycles you know at first they didn't want to borrow us but then yeah. you know um you know to get us in in at yarrow valley cycles we had to do custom labels for them so every shred bottle had a yarrow <laughs> on it. They like, couldn't say no. Yeah. So we just got creative. You know, we're small enough to to be creative and dynamic and can do small print runs of labels. Yeah, it's not that cost effective, but it still got us involved mm. in, in at one of the biggest bike shops in Australia. You know, Drift Bikes. Um, I knew Teddy who was running that. Um, Sick, yeah. When I was at Monza, we were doing Oakley as well, and I knew Teddy from his Oakley days, and, and that's how we got into Drift. So it was just like using our, my connections from back in the day, Um you know, to benefit something of my own was really nice. Do you find like, um, 
a lot of those you might hit up those connections and you might be using that connection to do it and then they actually try the product and it's like they might be a bit dubious at, at some point but then they try it and they're like oh this is actually sick 100 percent. yeah yeah of course i mean um a, a lot of you know what we did in getting it into stores with favors or repaying favors or just having those connections. I mean, good luck not having that kind of network and trying to get a bike care brand into some of those places. And then they use it and it's gone, fuck, it's actually really good. And then the way we were marketing it towards the kids and it started moving off the shelves. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I was lucky, um, that we had those connections or else I think it would have been a, a, a lot more challenging. What, whose idea was it to put the uh, silicon spray in a pump bottle and not in an aerosol? Because that's yeah. one of the best things ever. Yeah. Um, oh, shit, probably Victor's. Yeah. Um, Victor's not, you know, he's no longer a partner. Um, Victor got out of it um, late last year, uh, but he was a, a huge part of that brand um, and it definitely wouldn't be what it was without him. Um, but, you know, there was three of us in on it and it's just, it was just too many people. Victor decided to, to jump off, but I'm pretty sure that was um, Victor's idea to put that in. But like, you know, honestly, the far shine is my favorite product. Mm. Every and, day. Um, yeah. I love, I love that thing. I mean, our degreaser is also really good. Um, I mean, fuck all of our products are good, but that far shine, you know, mm. I love it. And for some reason, I used to love Maxima SC one and still do. Um, yeah. And we took a lot of inspiration from that product and we just wanted to, you know, be as good, maybe better. I think it's as good or better than um, SC1, but that was the market leader for that category. And I've, as a, since I was a kid, you know, I started racing motorbikes when I was four. Fuck, my dad would spray silicon polish over everything. I'd jump on my bike <laughs> and the seat would have it. And like, it's just, <laughs> I grew up spraying that shit everywhere and, and I, I still love it and like to keep all our things nice and shiny. So yeah, our far shine um, is a favorite of mine. Yeah. I used it in the car the other day and then got it on the steering wheel and I was like, oh, this is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> but it, it is a, such a good product. It is, it is genuinely, I mean, you know, the, the, the bike care market is flooded and a lot of people would say it's all the same thing, right? Um, and we've been accused of that or we've been accused of copying brands and you know what, I can genuinely say that we stayed in our lane and we didn't copy anyone of anything, you know, I didn't even, you know, and, and that's, I would, you know, if, probably if, if the shoe was on the other foot, I'd probably say the same thing, whether it's just because I would have felt threatened or they genuinely thought that, but I can, you know, hand in my heart, say that we didn't copy anyone with anything. Um, we stayed in our lane the whole time and, and you know, we just want what's best for our product and our brand and and that's what we've done. It's worked, obviously. Like it's... Yeah, I mean, it definitely worked to start with right now and everyone knows it's pretty tough out there. Um but that's okay. It's it, I'm fortunate that it's you know it's a, a side hustle for me and it's not our sole source of income. We don't owe any money. Um, we've got stock. Our distributor is going great. Um, so you know we're in a pretty good spot. So it's you know there's no complaints and the market's not going to be like this forever. Um, no. You know I've seen it come and go. Well, not so much in mountain biking because I've only been involved in you know mountain biking over the last say five six years since my son was into it. I've always come from that moto background, but I've seen moto do it. So it'll be back, and and when it's back, we'll we'll be totally fine. What's it? Was it? Has it been nerve wracking at all? Like, what's it been like for seeing this downturn? And you're only like two years into, it, two three years into it. Like, yeah, again, I mean, lucky that it's it's a side hustle for me, and and if it was, you know, if I was using shred to put food on my kids' table, yeah, I'd probably be worried. And um, mm. but I think. Uh, yeah, no, it hasn't been too stressful. I do worry about some of the other bike stores. It sucks to see. It really sucks to see a bunch of bike stores, you know, shut their doors recently and brands disappear or, you know, big retailers cull staff and whatever. Like it's a massive bummer to see the industry go through that because we went through such a great time mm. during that COVID period and, and I kind of think everyone just got a bit of false sense of confidence from that and, um. I don't know. You mean you tell me? You you talk to a lot of people. You've worked at bike shops. You talk to most people in the industry. I'll I'll spin it back on you. 
you know, why do you think it is and how do you think people are feeling? I uh, I think it's definitely it's weird because there was a false redefinition of what it was like before. So because the market held so crazy for two or three years, people forgot how quiet it was in 2019 or 2018. Yeah. Um, like, you know, you'd work in a store and you'd get your hours cut to two, three days a week, like in mm-hmm. winter, like you feel lucky. And But through COVID, it was like Christmas 365 a year. Yeah, and, right. uh, I'm not sure whether there's enough, um, especially in local stores, I'm not sure if there's enough business or marketing education so they kind of got a false sense of security for a lot of stores that i know and they think oh it's just going to be like this forever but yeah for sure yeah and then kept I mean, not, ordering. Only, not only bike stores with that but also distributors i mean we mm. know you know and won't go won't go naming names but there's some distributors out there with bikes who are sitting on fucking bunning size warehouses full of stock yeah yeah Concerned because of that and that kind of you know when they're gutting prices to you know and they have to because they've got the stock but it's just that snowball effect. Well, like you look at Kona in America where they did a two for one deal, like you, oh, really? yeah, you bought what? one bike and you got another one for free. No way, like any bike should have loaded up. <laughs> I mean, I but don't yeah. want to do that because I'm not going to sell them because even the the, the second hand bike market's gone to shit. But like that just shows how much money you're hemorrhaging in storage and warehousing if it's cheaper for you to get rid of a bike than it is for you to hold it. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I think that's probably enough doom and gloom. We don't need to be too negative about the space because we all love it and, you know, we're all here and, and we're going to be here for a long time. And at the end of the day, I just hope it picks up. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm sure it will. I've seen it in Moto. Maybe perhaps not this bad, but it's not going to be like this forever and, and, and we'll be fine. The positive side is I still think the market is bigger than what it was in 2019. There's less people yeah. spending money, but once everything settles down, the market will be bigger. So yeah. two or three years, it's going to be better than 2019 and it'll yeah. be sweet. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You kind of mentioned like you were in the moto market and this like, what are some of the moto marketing and, and business things you've seen that have happened in moto that could be possibly used in mountain biking and vice versa, especially when it comes to the sport side of things as well? Uh, that's a really good question, and I wish I'd have paid more attention to that. <laughs> um, from a marketing point of view, I think they're all very similar. Like the crossover in the audience is, you know, very, very similar. Um, you know, if I go out for a trail ride on a motorbike, which I don't do often, but if I did knowing that audience and then went out for a mountain bike ride the next day, like a trail mountain bike ride, they're a very, very similar audience. So you'd, you'd market to that, that that audience, the trail, the mountain bike trail rider versus the motorbike motors or the dirt bike trail rider, very similar. The motocross guy and the downhill guy are also very similar. So, I mean, I don't think that any brand in moto marketing um, should do or would or would be or are doing anything different to what some bike brands are. And, you I mean, you've got to think brands like Fox, they're, mm. they're, they're across both anyway. Um, and the marketing guy, for example, you know, um, Austin Hoof, he's across both sides. So... They, you know, it's, it's all very similar. I mean, if they were different, you wouldn't have the same person yeah. um, looking at the marketing or in charge of marketing on both sides. You'd have, you know, um, different people with different skill sets targeting different audiences. But for that reason, um, you've got the same guy looking after the, the two different disciplines. I mean, um, Fox used to have a surf, you know, massive push in surf. That's there's right. No, yeah. There's no, there's no way the moto slash mountain bike guys looking after surf because that's completely different. Yeah. So you, my point is that it's very similar because they do. Most brands will have the one guy looking after both categories because they're all very similar. What about from like an events perspective as well? Like, obviously, the thing I noticed with the Supercross is uh, I went to one as a kid, but this is the first one I've been to in ages. Was that one in uh, where we went last year? 
yeah. entertainment center. And I was just like, oh, how did I not realize that everyone can just sit around the racetrack and watch for hours and see everything? Yep. So well, it's, is- a, it's a show factor too. You're right. It's um, accessibility. I mean, we can run a supercross race at the Adelaide Entertainment Center with 7,500 people. Um, and then we can run one here in Melbourne at Marvel Stadium with 35,000 people, <laughs> right? And no matter how big the crowd side is, you're, they're there. Mm. You're that close to the action. I love downhill for what it means to my son and the weekends I have away with my mate and his boy. We have the best time. But I've got to walk up a fucking mountain and I don't like walking that much, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to watch it come down for two seconds, and then I'm like, "Fuck!" You know, if I didn't know, if I couldn't remember what race number he was, I've, you know how many times I've walked up that mountain and actually missed him. Oh, and then, yeah. then he gets to the bottom. Yep, cool, Dad, I made it down. All right, let's just walk back down. Then, I mean, from a spectator point of view, from a live show, downhill is so hard to market mm. because how are you paying? spectators to come and watch a race when you're watching one part, like you're going to go, you know, ball on the weekend, I'll walk down and watch the Jeep track section. Cause that was the gnarly bit. Um, and that's where everyone was, but no one else walked down any part of that track except for that bit. Mm. But you can't, you can't sell tickets for that. No. Because there's no opening ceremony. There's no, you know, you might get a little bit of a podium or a couple of, you know, the people are standing on a bit of timber at a log at the end of the day and they get their goodie bag and and that's it. There's no champagne moment. There's no, there's none of that. So it makes it really hard. And that's why I think what Red Bull did with the World Cups was amazing because their broadcast mm-hmm. was good. You know, they had, they were out in the middle of nowhere with probably fuck all phone reception, which also makes it really difficult from a live broadcast, a live timing communication with none of that, with no service. It makes it really difficult to run an event. So they did a really good job. Um, They did the best job. Like they made that Mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. But, and I've never been to a World Cup, so I don't even know if a spectator would pay tickets for it, but I don't know why you would, because what would you see other than, where, you know, I know on the broadcast, they're all down the bottom. They've got that huge crowd of where they ride through. So, you know, and that huge mm. crowd when they cross the finish line, but that crowd's just watching the rest of it on a big screen. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you know, I know they've got the activations and they can meet the riders and stuff, which is a massive thrill for the kids. So, I mean, again, on the other hand, as a dad, I probably would pay to take my son there to give him that experience. But it's hard to be a spectator of those things, and that's why. I would much watch, much prefer to watch a downhill race on TV the way Red Bull did it than actually go to the live show because it's you're not getting that that experience. Plus, plus I think um, the time you're there for, you know, a Supercross race, you get there at two o'clock, you go through the pit party, the race starts at five o'clock, and then it's over within two hours. So you're there for like a five six hour window. Downhill, you kind of got to get through qualifying, pra- you know, practice, quality, and now they've put those stupid fucking semifinals on. And, <laughs> and, and then you've got to watch, you know, and they're not even pushing it. Like, fuck, I hate what they've done with the World Cups this year. I mean, tell me how that makes sense when Red Bull had a seeding run, which they would just get through, and that race run, they fucking send it. Mm. They can't, none of them are really going to send that semifinal because no. they don't want to bin it. But then they're not pushing themselves to the limit. So you're not seeing – you're only seeing that top 10 or whatever get through to that final actually Mm. in in full send mode because they're not going 100% in the the semis trying to get through because they're also mindful that they don't want to bin it to get through. I don't know. I don't agree with that new format, and I didn't pay to watch it last year because I I watch highlights and bits and pieces. But I will say I'll watch it this year. Because yeah. um, you know, th- I've got a, we've got a bit of a connection with Jackson Goldstone now, and 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 Laurie oh, and those boys. Um, I only met him a couple of weeks ago, but um, at Threadbow. Um, but my son's a fox kid, and th- we got to spend a bunch of time with him, with, which was really lovely. And uh, they're great kids. And just by chance, um, we were at dinner with um, the Syndicate team, and Jackson's a huge Supercross fan, like massive. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, 
you know, I think there's a possibility of running a world supercross round in Vancouver this year and he's half an hour away. So we got chatting and all of a sudden, you know, we, we'll, we'll use him, you know, um, as an ambassador potentially of that event. And he's like, yeah, bring Hudson over, you, you know, you, we can, you know, do the supercross stuff. And the week after I'll take him riding and Hudson's looking at me going, dad, like, what the fuck? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's try and make this happen. You know? Um, so, you know, I'll watch it now for that reason. I've got a bit of an invested interest with those boys, just based purely based on the experience that they gave me and my son a mm. couple of weeks ago. And so, I'll, you know, I'll probably pay reluctantly to watch it. And um, it depends where it is because no one knows yet. Like, I still don't know where it is going to be broadcast in Australia. Is that the truth? Yeah, I don't. I think it's it might be KO or something, but yeah. KO would be all right. Because yeah. I've already got, I just don't want to have to pay Discovery that two hundred bucks to watch it like it was last year. Yeah, no, that's all being shut down. So, oh, thank God for that. Yeah, um, because yeah, it's gone to Max. They're they're doing like a an Eurosport cycling channel in Europe, and okay. that's going to go to Ko and whatever here, like whatever Eurosport. Well, that makes it a little. That makes it different. Then I'll hundred percent watch it. I yeah. just mm, don't know, but I'll say that. But again, I really struggle with the format. Yeah, well, there's no semifinals for race day this year. That's like after qualies. So I don't think that, I don't, I don't know, but I still don't. Yeah, and you have to watch that if you want to see some of the guys. Like, what if you want to watch Amory or someone? He sends True. it. And if he bins it, you don't get to watch him on the Sunday, mm. but I want to watch him because I know how fucking hard he sends it. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of have to watch it all. It's just, a, it's just not right. It's a pain in the ass, in my opinion. But again, I'm not that close to it. And I'm sure there's way smarter people in rooms talking about this, making decisions <laughs> for the right reason, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah, we'll go with smarter. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's such a weird year for, for downhill. I'm very interested to see what happens. But um, none of, it doesn't sound like any of the athletes like it. I mean, I listened to the Gypsy Tale podcast with Tani and she, she was saying she didn't like it. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm not in... I won't repeat what the boys were talking about it because I don't want to get anyone in trouble or whatever, but it just doesn't seem like anyone's stoked with that format. I wouldn't be, not if I was a racer. Like, mm-hmm. You're just risking your job twice for no extra benefit. And like, Yeah, I know. You're not getting paid the twice amount to go and send it. Because they released the format after contract season. So, yeah. like, mm-hmm. it makes no sense. Yeah. Um, sweet. Uh what was your time? So, like, how did you kind of get into working for Fox and getting into this position that you are now? Like, yeah, so was- it's a bit of a long story. Um, I left school. I mean, let's go back right from the start. Um, I started racing motocross when I was four years old and um, rode, rode motor, you know, motocross right up until my mid-20s. Um, my brother was the same, so Cam's only 16 months younger than me. Um, and he still to this day does it for a living. Um, he, moved, he moved from racing to freestyle. So Cam's in Nitro Circus and does all that bit. Um, he does, he, you know, he did X Games. He's three time X Games medalist. He's, you know, Red Bull X Fighters, now Nitro Circus. Um, so we just, you know, we're bound to, to create our careers this way i think you know all through the, the opportunities we got through dad um and mum and yeah we grew up riding um dad had a decent like a successful plumbing business um i left school pretty early probably way too early to become a plumber and just that's you know if i wasn't going to be a racer that's what i was going to do i finished my apprenticeship when i was 19 and going fuck i don't want to be a plumber um Bad. i Fair ended enough. up uh, you know what though now i'm kind of like hmm, kind of wish i'd have stuck it out um, but it's, um, yeah, just through meeting people. What are, when I left, when I finished plumbing, I went and worked, um, for a company called Full Throttle Sports and they were running grassroots events here in Melbourne, um, mot- motorbike or dirt bike events. From that time, I met a the guy called Trevor Brooks and he was the course builder of X Games and Krusty Demons back then That's and sick. all that. I got a job with him um, building, you know, all the ramps and, and, you know, not building, bolting ramps together in, at venues for Krusty Tours. So, um, and I'd also do the stage management at Krusty Tours. 
Uh, from there, I met a guy called Scott Runciman, um, and till this day, he's still one of my really good friends, and he's been a massive, huge mentor in my life. But he was the brand manager of Fox at Monster Imports, um, and I was 23 by then. And yeah, he um, he brought me in as as his assistant, I guess, at 23. Yeah, well. Back then, when you were with brands like that, though, each of the product managers would do their own marketing. There were really no such thing as a marketing guy. Mm-hmm. And I always had a marketing head on me through school and whatever, and I'd always do my own sponsorship deals and my brother's sponsorship deals through high school, and we'd do all right. Like, we'd get heaps of, heaps of free shit just by, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't actually remember how I did it. But, um, yeah, so long story short, I create, after a couple of years, um, working with Scotty and Fox, I created this marketing role there and and John, the owner of Monza and Scotty were really supportive and I kind of moved away from that product management side of it to a marketing side of it and and that's kind of when the social media really kicked off and I had a huge interest in social and content and, and to this day I still do. And uh, yeah, kind of all just went from there and I was... Um, Really fortunate with that with that role at Fox. Like I mean, some of the best times of my life working in motocross, supercross, wake, um, BMX, and you know, being that guy that would go to. You know, I was the athlete manager too, so being that guy, I'd go to every, every single event. Um, and you know, Fox was a brand that I grew up with. You know, as a kid racing motocross since he was four, I was four years old, that was you know my rip curl to a surfer. You know, it was my f- favorite brand and and still is. Um, and yeah, so I was living the dream. Um, by the time I left there, I was 30, 35 or something, but I had two kids at that stage and it was just like, you know, having two kids under four, going to events every weekend, it was just getting too much and putting too much pressure on my wife and family life and whatever. And it was just time. I'd been there for 10 years and I got an opportunity from there to go to the Peter Stevens Retail Group um, on the Harley Heaven side of things. Um, I wouldn't say I went reluctantly. I went there because it suited my family lifestyle at the time, no travel, although I did get to travel quite a bit internationally with that, but not every weekend I was away. But, man, I didn't love Harleys, but I didn't actually know anything. I didn't know know anything about them. Yeah. But that was one brand that can suck you in. I grew so passionate about Harley Davidson so quickly just based off its heritage um, yeah. and its passion for its own brand. It's like a whole different world inside that. It's like a bubble. And once you're in it, man, you, you live and breathe it. So I ended up being there for eight years. I didn't think I would. Um, from there, you know, again, I started after about six years, I started getting a little bit bored. I mean, Harley just dominates that space and you don't have to do mm. anything extra from a marketing point of view to have wins. So we're kind of just doing the same thing over and over again and COVID kicked in and that's when Shred kicked off. Um, You know, COVID was a really tough time for Harley and, you know, we um, just didn't do as much and I lost a bit of passion for it. And I started looking around a little bit. I got introduced to um, the guys at uh, PON um, and was talking to them about, uh, getting a marketing director role with Santa Cruz. And, um, yeah, we're going back and forth. They asked for a reference and I spoke to Bailey because I've worked with Bailey, you know, um, forever. And I said, hey, I'm talking to Santa Cruz. Do you give me a reference? I need one. He's like, yeah, sure. Um, and then half an hour later, he called me back and said, nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're jumping off there, come and, come and work with us. So, Took a little while to get over the line back and forth and and then, yeah, uh, back in February last year, I started with the AME group and, yeah, I really am stoked to be where I am now. I I mean, I love what I do here. I feel like this. I'm back where I belong in this space, um, running this Australian Supercross Championship and working uh, a lot, you know, working with the World Supercross Championship and the Jet and Hunter stuff. Like, this is my area. This is what I grew up um, Mm in. doing and and i'm one of those lucky guys that wake up wakes up in the morning and love going to work like i just don't have that feeling which i you know started to get in my last role where you'd wake up and just go fuck i don't want to do this today i haven't had one of those single moments yet and 
um, it's it's really cool. So, yeah, I'm very lucky. I mean, fuck, I'm not going to sit here and say it's all beer and Skittles. We all have our days at work and, you know, I just struggle sometimes as much as the next bloke with, you know, you have your days and, and um, but I'm very fortunate enough that, you know, between what I do for my day job and shred and my kids, it's, it's, you know, life's pretty good. I'm sure like world-class riders, moto or mountain bikes still wake up on days and they're just like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, I'm sure they do. I'm not dropping in or doing some of the shit they're doing either though. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, we might start wrapping things up so you can, you can get home on time. Um, I figured since you're in kind of a unique position that's been like a part of marketing for brands and, you know, you've talked to athletes, you, you work around a lot of athletes and stuff. Um, for my first kind of first last question, what advice would you give to some up-and-coming riders or juniors that yeah. would like to get sponsored mm-hmm. or put themselves out there to, to get some support? Um, invest in content. Content is king. Um, you don't have to be the fastest guy out there to to get looked after. Mm. Um, you know, not all these guys from the races are going to the big downhill series. You know, I don't know anyone from brands representing, you know, who represent brands or working brands are going to grassroots mountain bike races. Mm. So, and, you know, and the people who are going there, there's 300 people there. At a, at a, you know, you got the national round in Adelaide this weekend. You're going to be there this weekend. There might be fucking 300 people there over the weekend in terms of spectators. Maybe, you know? yeah. All right, so that's what that's, that's my point. Race results are great. You want to be riding really good, but, man, content is king. Mm-hmm. If you are going to those races, you know, you don't have to invest in a shooter, but ask your dad to follow you around with a camera, and then you can go and edit a reel. Just be seen. Be seen online. Have an online presence. You know, and that's most kids these days do, right? Um, every kid has an online presence with Instagram, but fucking use it properly. Don't use it to, you know, a lot of these kids will go to a mountain bike race and their Instagram stories are full of what they're doing on the Saturday night, riding mm-hmm. around town, jumping off ledges, you know, being kids. And that's totally fine too, but there's no quality content coming out of that. There's no... There's no, you know, strategy. I, I, I even do with my son now, and you know, we have a social strategy for him. Yeah, he can have his Snapchat and do whatever else, but in terms of his, you know, his profile online through those major channels, have a strategy. Yeah, let people, you know, you're going to a race that week from a photo that you've got from a previous round. Can't wait for Bore Bore this weekend. My favorite track, Fox, have got me looking with fire emojis. Yeah, and yeah. then. You know, I get a bunch of clips and other dads, you know, we've got this thing with race dads. We all get clips of each other's kids <laughs> around the end Sick. of the day. We all we all position ourselves on different parts of the track so we're not just fucking watching them come down. We can actually see bits of it. Yeah. Um, we've got a bunch of dads. pretty cool actually. So, But then you use that content to build a, mm. a, a reel after it and just be seen. Um, but make sure that that's kind of, you know, you don't need to have a – a professional shooter following you around. iPhones are amazing these days and the way you can edit a reel on Instagram is unbelievable. You can look quite good quite easily with not a lot of effort, but you still need to put the effort in and you need to put some thought behind it. So my number one bit of advice is invest into a social strategy and invest in decent content and don't be a dickhead on social media. Fair, yeah. Man, like, um, there's an app I downloaded the other day, uh, CapCut. And yeah. Like, it does it for you. Like, you can literally just go use this template and it does everything for you. It's- I know. I mean, kids are all over that. They're all there using that. Uh, I'm surprised you've only just got it. I mean, I've got it. I really don't use it a lot. If I do a reel, I just do it in Instagram because I'm kind of not that creative. But kids are using CapCut flat out. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, but that's what I mean. But use CapCut for the right thing. Don't use CapCut, you know, at a ball ball last weekend, I hardly saw any content come out of it. You know, there's, so many, on. <laughs> there's so many good races, you know, like kids, they all ride, they're gnarly. I saw more content on their stories from fucking around, you know, riding around the village of the night time and just being kids and having fun. They all do it. They're mm-hmm. not doing it bad, but they, 
it's more important for them to be seen doing that kind of thing. And that's fine if that's what they want to do. But if you want to be someone in this space, if you want to be seen, if you want to get looked after from a bike shop or a distributor for a set of gear or a set of tires, put some effort into a strategy, stick to it, um, and mm. roll it out with, you know, make sure it's quality. What did, um, over this time, doing all these roles and, and learning and stuff, is there anything you kind of regret or would have done differently up until now? Yeah, oh, of course. I mean, not really a regret. I mean, <laughs> early days, you know, when I was 24 and I was the guy going to the races, I wish I had a, not had such a ego and probably shut me mouth sometimes. Um, <sighs> but no, I mean, I have no regrets sometimes. No, I have no regrets. But you definitely, as you get older, you learn and look back and go, hmm, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that or done that, especially when forums were big. I used to get on the, I used to love a forum. I used to fucking love ruffling some feathers on there and then I'd be dragged into the office. Mick, you know, you represent me, but you can't say that shit. You're on there, Mick Sinclair from Monza or you're there, Mick Sinclair from yeah, yeah. And You can't go saying that. You know, I remember one time there was a motocross race at Horsham and it wasn't great, but I got home and I fucking teed off. And then you know, the poor guy, but this is the kind of thing that the regrets I have. They're all volunteers running that event, right? And I've gone back. I'm a fucking 25-year-old dickhead who's just had a weekend away working. I get paid, like, you know, in, you're out. There's no dramas. Sick. These poor guys have busted their ass in 40-degree heat getting that ready. It was dusty, and I've gone home and teed off. And yeah. then the, the the promoter of the Pro Motocross Championships called my boss because he's had the fucking poor president of that club see that, and, and then I'm getting dragged over the hot coals, and that was a massive – learning curve for me i tell you one thing i do right now from that experience is i walk down every time i'm walking down that hill at a downhill race and i see a, a guy there volunteering who i know has got a kid there or he just loves it i go and say thank you yeah 100 hey, thanks so much for your time volunteering mate hey you got any rubbish here you need me to take back i am so thankful for the volunteers in this space and i've probably learned from that experience where i teed off on this poor club from just being a dickhead because I thought of, I wasn't even riding. I was just because I was there hot and dusty and shit. And then mm. I drive back in my air conditioned car, like, fuck, <laughs> who was I to complain about it, you know? And that was fucking 17 years ago now. And that's something I do regret. I wish I didn't do that. But from that experience, I've learned and I make sure I go out of my way. And even people who work with us, I make sure they feel appreciated because they don't need to do what they're doing. They don't need to volunteer that time. And if they didn't, we'd all be <laughs> fucked. There'd be, there'd be no event. So I make sure from that experience, I go out of my way and make sure, you know, for whatever worse, it means nothing because who the fuck am I at these races and these downhill events? You know, no one. It's just like, but I just want them to know that someone appreciates what they do. Mm, 100%. Last question is, um, we did chat about this a little bit, but if you uh, have got up and you haven't got any motivation or you, you're cooked and you really can't be bothered walking around track or, you know, things are a bit hectic, um, what do you do to kind of get motivated? Like do you listen to any music or or have anything to kind of G up? No, um, no, I chat. I talk to people. If I'm having a shit day or I'm feeling a flat, I am definitely not one person to to hide it. I used to be shocking at it. Yeah. Um, if I've got a really good, um, group of people in the close network, I guess. And I know I could go up and if I'm having a shit day, I won't be if, mentally, if I wake up and just not feeling it or for whatever reason, there's no reason why you feel shit some days. And we mm. all like that Whether you, you know, you're a tough guy. I think that doesn't happen. I'm calling bullshit because it fucking happens. Um, I know that I've got a bunch of people, um, men and women, I can just go and say, I'm feeling like shit today. I don't know why. Fuck, I can't be bothered. And just by having that conversation and getting that off your chest and maybe letting one person who you're close to know how you're feeling, you instantly feel better. And then if you do, if you're still not feeling better enough that you want to talk about it more, I can talk about it more. And then, you know, within a couple of couple of minutes, I'm feeling good again and then we're ready to go. Yeah, let's see. I really like that. That's that's pretty rad. You um, have to. I mean, yeah. I would recommend that to anyone. If you're feeling shit, and we all feel shit, whether you're feeling shit for a reason, you know, there's 
whether you're feeling shit because you've said something to someone and then, fuck, I wish I didn't say that, you're going to feel like shit. Just get it off your chest. Yeah. If you're feeling shit for no reason whatsoever, everyone's got someone they can talk to. And if they don't, then they really should. And if you don't, what? You know what? Find me on Instagram and tell me. Mm. Uh, you know, I'll, fuck, I'll be that person for you if you don't have someone out there to talk to, even if I don't know you. Um, but by getting that shit off your chest sometimes make it, makes you feel instantly better. And yeah. if you keep talking, the more you talk about it, you know, if it doesn't work, talk about it more. It's going to, you're going to start feeling better. And that's what I do. No podcast, self help podcasts are going to help me. I see through a lot of that bullshit. Um, you know, I'm not writing, so I'm not there going to listen to fucking Pantera trying to pump me up for the day. It's True. really, it's really having those conversations. You know, I don't feel shit often, but you know, like I said, we all do. So hmm. that's, that's what works for me. What a better, uh, what a great note to, to kind of end on, man. Uh, I appreciate that. That was sick. No, cool. No problems. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Uh, hopefully we can catch up at an event soon. And, uh, yeah, no, no doubt. We'll get you back on board for Adelaide. You were great for us over there. I've seen you turn into a bit of a moto guy, shooting, um, <laughs> and, you know, shooting Elijah and I'm like, fuck yeah, look at you go. No, it's good to see you um, cross over into that space. You did a great job. And like I said, um, I appreciate everything you do for Shred. You know, um, we, you know, you look at the Shred Instagram, a bunch of the recent content, um, especially around product is your work. And it's great to work with you on that. I know you bust your ass for this industry. You're everywhere. You know, even before I met you, I saw you at Mans uh, Mansfield at Highline one year, and I knew who you were. Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, we're, our industry is lucky to have people like you doing this because not a lot of people do, and, and it definitely deserves it. So, you know, um, I'm a guest, but thank you for everything you do for this industry. Thanks for the way you push Shred, and um, I'm stoked to be working with you on some Moto stuff as well. No worries, man. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Easy. Well, uh, take, take it easy and uh, have a safe drive home, man. There we go, legends. That was Mick Sinclair. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Absolutely love chatting to this guy. Um, super positive. Always willing to give someone a chance. Yeah, just super open-minded. He's just such a nice guy and I'm stoked to be working with him on a few things. Um, as I said before, thanks to our supporters, Trek Bikes, Franked Mountain Bike Apparel, Shred Bike Care, um, Fist Handwear, Lead Out Sports, Capped Out Caps and Oakley. Absolutely love those guys for supporting the podcast. Without them, this would not be happening, especially in the current economic climate. Um, yeah, if you guys want to help the podcast, uh, share it around. Share it around with some mates. It's completely free. Tell people about it. Share it on Insta. Uh, just get the word out there. It'd be really great. I want to see this thing kind of take off a little bit more this year. And yeah, anything you can do to help that would be amazing. Uh, 2025 will be huge if we can make this year pretty rad. Anyway, thanks for listening. And until next time, as always, go and have a bunch of fun.